Welcome to Talking Heads on USA Global TV, starring the one and only wonderful Dr. Jacqueline. It's a prestigious place where world-class influencers and experts meet, and where you'll find the most trusted advisors and coaches for all things in life and business. Visit usaglobaltv.com to sign up for our newsletter, get the value you need, and be first in line to learn about events and giveaways and other valuable content. Connect with us. Email Dr. Jacqueline at usaglobaltv.com to talk about how you can become part of USA Global TV. That's USA Global TV, where the doctor is always in. Hello, everyone, and happy holidays. Welcome to USA Global TV and radio, where we celebrate elevated listening. I'm Dr. Jacqueline Kerbeck, the president, founder, and chief listening officer here at our network, where we celebrate elevated listening. And our show today is super important and fantastic information for people out there who are struggling with taking care of someone who has dementia or Alzheimer's disease or not sure where to turn, what to do. So our guest has been on our program, other programs, not the Corner Bookstore before, and we are super excited to welcome her back because she is a four-time survivor of caregiving of people in her family who've had dementia. Diane Floyd Bay, my co-host and friend, has the day off. So let's welcome Tracy Cram Perkins joining us from the West Coast of the United States. Hello. Hi, everybody. <laughs> nice to see you. I hope I got that right. Have you been on the Corner Bookstore before? I have not been on the Corner Bookstore before. Good. My, my memory is, is still good. So <laughs> considering what we're talking about today. So Tracy, I have to just share with our audience because this has literally blown me away. You wrote this phenomenal book, which I have, my sister has, uh, a number of people I know have, and the book has sold so many copies. You also have created additional communities of people who are embracing one another and sharing stories about what life has been like as a caregiver of someone with dementia. Tell us more about this and then we'll get into your backstory. Oh, well, okay. The I wasn't expecting the book to do as well as it's been doing, but the having one of my Facebook ads literally turn into a community where people were sharing their stories and actually helping each other solve problems and they were asking questions and it has literally uh, turned into a community of all sorts of people um, all over the world. Uh, there's thousands of comments on there and everyone's willing to share and it's just been a phenomenal experience. Congratulations. That is super exciting because we hear so many times that people publish a book and there's not a lot of copies sold or people place an ad on social media and there's no results. So not only did you publish a book <laughs> that has sold thousands and thousands of copies, you've created an ad that has drawn people in and just committed people to helping one another. I absolutely love that. So for people who are watching and they're thinking, you know, I've heard of dementia, I've heard of Alzheimer's, I don't know anyone who has it, I don't really understand it. And we know you're not a medical professional, but you are someone who is a survivor of <laughs> caregiving. Tell us about what dementia and Alzheimer's looks like in your experience. Ah, okay. It, at first, it, it didn't look like anything. It just looked like ordinary aging. And then we started noticing small things, you know, uh, for have a, having trouble remembering how to do simple tasks, uh, not remembering that you had done something, repeating stories two, three, four, ten 10 times uh, within a space of an hour, uh, things that just started creeping up. And at first we were chalking it up to, you know, it's just an old age thing or they're tired or exhausted or uh, we, we were kept trying to make it something else and it wasn't. And it wasn't until there would be some health crisis that we would land in the middle of 
full-blown dementia care. And so just seeing that they couldn't pay their bills anymore, that they, and, and most people don't reach out for help or they're too embarrassed to say anything, or maybe they've even had somebody swindle them out of some money and they don't want to tell you because it was, it was so embarrassing. Um, there's just so many different aspects to this that are, are hints. So if they're having trouble uh, taking their medications, which we had a lot of problems with that, uh, if they aren't remembering to pay their bills and you suddenly start getting uh, creditors calling you, um, there was just many little things that started adding up to the point where we had to step in for each family member. And so in, in our case, it was like by the time we got in there to help, because the first two times I still was too naive to recognize all of the signs. And so at that point, uh, I would come in and there was like, you know, $28,000 charged on a credit card and they hadn't made a payment on it. There were, you know, bills stacked up everywhere, piles everywhere of things that just were collecting, uh, basically hoarding. And all of these things, if, if you don't know that they're part of the dementia journey, you will chalk it up to something else. So it's really easy to say it's this, that, or the other thing when it really is dementia. And then there's other times when it's not really dementia, but it's a competing uh, health issue that if it's taken care of, you can prevent the dementia. So I appreciate what you just shared. I'm envisioning coming into the house into the room and and seeing all of these signs that the, the patient probably is not aware of or just doesn't notice or doesn't care and you're seeing it for the first time going wow there's something going on here we we had a, an experience with my father where he had a he had a Cadillac. It was an old Cadillac. It was like a tank. And he kept running into things. And then he kept telling me that it was it was doing great. It would go for thousands of more miles. And he hadn't changed the oil. The oil ran dry and the engine blew up. So uh, there was several, I mean, but I didn't know to look for that because I, I'll be honest, I'm not a mechanic. I mean, I know some things about cars, but I I didn't know that he wasn't checking as well because at, at that point, my dad had been so self-sufficient and he could just do everything for himself that uh, it, it was just a shock to make these discoveries. And also he was really good at covering. So we always had something that he would, you know, say that that was plausible and we would go with it because we didn't understand at the, at that point that there was something going on. Now, obviously down the road, I started getting sharper and was catching on to these things. And I understood when he was covering. And, and so, and also he would rise to the occasion as would the rest of my family members, whenever anybody else was around, they would be more bright and appear more with it than they would when nobody, when, when we were just by ourselves. And I realized that was also part of the disease. And so it was really interesting for me to discover this and find out that, that, so like when we go into doctor's appointments and then the doctor would see one person and when I get him home, I'd see somebody else. So it was another telling sign to me that this is a problem. And I started having to log things. So I kept a journal so I could say, okay, these are the things that are happening just to make my case. And and it was how we were able to get him to uh, give up his driver's license and stop driving. And actually, he was, now this is unusual, he was relieved not to have to drive anymore. Um, I, I think it was subconsciously bothering him that there were all these issues with his vehicle and and we were taking care of him at that point and then he didn't have to deal with it. So for him, that was a really good thing. My mom, her shock for driving was she had been, she had had cancer, she uh got the dementia from the surgery and from the chemo treatment, she ended up getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And my dad was too tired to take her out someplace she wanted to go. So she decided to drive herself while he was sleeping and got into the car, uh, backed it out of the driveway uh, into a ditch and then couldn't get the car to move. So we had to come over and get it towed out and back into their driveway. And that was for her very shocking because up to that point, she had been a very, very self-sufficient person and hadn't realized she'd declined that far. Wow. You know, yeah. we we talk a lot about being a caregiver and how it impacts the caregiver and what you just shared. I imagine that when a self-sufficient person realizes that everything has changed and they're no longer self-sufficient and they're no longer the master of their universe or in control of it, it has to be overwhelming. Did you get any uh, feedback or uh, any open hearted sharing? that you can um, share with us. Yes. And I'm going to share this because this could happen in your family. Um, when my dad moved in with us, 
he didn't believe he was going to get to stay. He didn't believe that, that, and this is also part of dementia. Whenever you move somebody to a new location, it can take them six months or more to adjust to that location. That doesn't happen for everybody, but generally speaking. And my dad tried to commit suicide the, within a month of him living with us because he didn't believe he'd get to stay. He saw that there was no hope. He thought that his world was ending and he couldn't take care of himself anymore. And it took us five more months beyond that working with him to help him through the depression, help him realize that his life wasn't over. We created a new life for him. And in doing so and giving, making sure that he got socialization, making sure that he had activities that he got to do every single day, uh, plus exercising, because that was a huge component was getting him out and exercising. Um, after that, uh, he was a different person, but we had to work through all of those emotional things. And it was hard on us too, because imagine when you find out that your father is trying to kill himself in under your roof. I mean, that's really hits you in the heart and it was not an expected thing. I mean, I did, I didn't expect that to happen. So, um, it's important to know that it could happen and, and they may or may not give you warning signs. So it's important to just kind of keep an eye open for it, if they become lethargic, if they aren't, you know, talking. I mean, it, cause part of it is if depending on how far they're in the dementia, part of it's the dementia, uh, but part of it can also be depression. But there, like I said, there are things that you can do and there's also medications that can help with that too. Although I don't really recommend, you know, over medicating someone, but occasionally, you know, if somebody needs that help, it is important to get it for them. Tracy, once again, I'm just blown away by everything that you are sharing to, to <laughs> help all of us. So how does one walk that line of caring for someone and also taking care of themselves? Okay, this is this is really important. You need to make sure that you carve out time and do not feel guilty for carving out time for taking care of yourself. There, you can get them into like adult day programs. Uh, don't call it adult daycare because that insinuates that they're a baby and we are all adults and we want to be treated like an adult. But if you can get them into whatever fits their story, for some people, they might uh, think of it as going to arts and crafts. And then the people at the adult daycare center can also so fit into that, or if they're a person that just loved books, they you can say they're going to their book club, or the if they're if they're with a withdrawn person, they're very shy. Then maybe they're going to go to a library. So you have to cater it to their story, and then once you are able to get them into something where you don't have to be present, then you get downtime. You can go work out. You can go have social time with some of your friends, whatever it is, even if it's like getting somebody from your church just to spend an hour chatting with them quietly, it's really helpful if they are a very chatty person. I mean, it's really hard if it's somebody that's not naturally outgoing, but anything that you can do to engage them and then, you know, making sure that you celebrate the person you know, that has the dementia so that they rise to the occasion and they will become involved and you'll find that you have a much better day and it's, it re it'll exhaust them and you won't have as severe as sundowners. So it's, it's, it's a multi functional thing where you get downtime, you get self care, they get downtime and self and to get to play because it's really important that we all take care of our, our inner child and, and get time to play. So doing that will help everybody. And then you also become a better caregiver as a result because you aren't burning out, you have downtime and, and you, you'll be more energized. And thank you for that. You just mentioned the term sundowners. Tell us what that is. Okay. Sundowners is, uh, happens in the evening. It's when they start having disruptive behaviors. And it's uh, generally if they are not exhausted enough or they haven't had enough activities, it becomes more pronounced. A lot of times it happens because they think they have activities they should be doing because usually in the evening, uh, you're preparing dinner or you're doing, you know, kids are doing their homework or whatever's going on. Everyone's got a job, but them. And so they are lost. They know they should be doing something. They don't know what it is, or they could be upset. Uh, it could be that some noise is upsetting them or a, a glare is uh, giving them a hallucination. It could be any number of things that's causing this. And it's finding some sort of solution to keep them occupied and busy and make them feel useful because we all like to feel useful. Uh, one of the things that, that I recommend to 
bunch of my friends is uh, using aprons. Uh, an apron indicates that you have a job. So if it's happening sometime around dinner, uh, everybody puts on an apron, everybody has a job. They get to go, maybe they're setting the table. It doesn't have to be artistic. It could be that they're just spreading forks everywhere. Uh, once they've done something and completed, it could be that they're, they're dusting. It doesn't matter if they do the same activity like 15 times in a row, just keep, whatever is making them feel needed and helpful, praise them after it's done. It doesn't matter if it's a scattered disaster. It doesn't matter. They did something. Praise them for that. Don't correct them. And then you will get a better behavior in the evening. They'll be tired and it'll be easier to get them to go to bed and you won't have them getting up and down constantly except to go to the bathroom. I love this. <laughs> I love this. It's about <laughs> praising instead of correcting. And yes. I'm sure for some folks out there, they're thinking, you know, it's really hard for me not to correct because I see things that are totally dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, we want to respect the person and also create an environment of positivity. We talked a little bit backstage about a, a couple of things, which I'd like to turn to now. One of them might just seem to some people to be a shock, but uh, people with dementia are not necessarily advocates of bathing themselves or grooming. And this can become a challenge. What can you share with us about this? Okay. Uh, time functions differently in the mind of someone with dementia. So let's use Alzheimer's disease as a specific here. With Alzheimer's disease, you uh, the brain is shrinking and the person is developing holes in their brain. So their story and their sense of time is going to be disconnected. And you're going to find that for you, it is Thursday. For them, it might be Sunday or Saturday. And so what we need to do is get into their world and then walk them through to a place where they're going to bathe. So for some people, it, they think they've bathed. And they're going to argue with you till you're blue in the face. So perhaps you want to create an environment where you invite them to bathe. So one of the things that we found successful with my dad was I would give him clothing that, uh, so what we do is, this is really funny. We would, I would take his clothes and I would wash them and I would have him help me in the evening wrap the pre them as a present for a friend. I would stick in there a recycled card that one of my friends had written out saying that they had given him this clothing. And then the, I would, at, when he was eating breakfast, I would sneak it in and put it on his pillow. And first of all, just keep in mind that it, while he was wrapping it, it was very artistic and I used that very loosely. Um, so it doesn't matter how it's wrapped. It's still wrapped. It's still a present. I would stick it on his pillow. He would find it after breakfast. Everyone gets excited when they find a present. So he would open this present up. He would be so thrilled. He'd want to go get cleaned up and put on the clothes because then I'd tell him, we're going to take a picture of you and I'm going to send it to whoever gave us this present. Um, and then I would get to wash his clothes. Um, the daily photo that I was doing with him was so that if he wandered, because my father was a consummate escape artist, I would have a photo of him. Uh, I'm going to digress here for just a second. He was so good at wandering off that the first time he wandered out of my house before I knew how to address this, um, I could not remember what he's wearing, even though he was wearing the, wearing the same clothing for three days in a row. And so I went on the Alzheimer's Association's website, found that part of the correcting this behavior was to take a daily photo that you can share with people, uh, police or anybody else that's going to help you search for them. Um, so I incorporated all of this. Plus we had fun then when I would be taking his photos because then I was the paparazzi and he was the model and he would play for me and we would have a really good time and we'd have a lot of fun with it. And I'd get my daily photo. I would also get that bath in there and we would have a good behavior day. So that was one thing that we did. Another thing that we did was sometimes it, depending on how the person is, you can suggest that there's a lady or gentleman caller coming over to visit and perhaps they'd like to freshen up. Also, you can create uh, little gift boxes with uh, certificates that you've made, handmade certificates for going to the spa and then create a spa experience for them when they go into the bathroom and then set it up with, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, with special towels and maybe some soap and a book to sign in because, you know, you sign into the spa, anything you can to create that environment, make sure there's nothing medical sitting out. So you don't have a uh, depend sitting out or a gate belt or whatever else. And also nothing that will detract or upset them. So if they're 
not good with mirrors, cover your mirrors, uh, especially uh, if this is the first time they aren't recognizing themselves, which happens in, when they get to moderate Alzheimer's disease. Uh, you want to like, if, if they're having a meltdown and they see themselves and they think somebody's watching them, uh, modesty is a huge issue. Cover it with wet paper towel until you have another way of covering it. Uh, we found that, you know, just using a, a, a curtain rod and, and curtains to pull over it was helpful for us. Uh, so that it became a window instead of a, a mirror. Uh, just anything you can do to make it so that it's not a mirror. Um, looking at the bathroom, I had to, my whole bathroom was all white. I didn't realize there was an issue with color, with contrast and they couldn't, my dad couldn't see where he was going. So I found out that I had to like, put colors around things. So I put a colored uh, mat at the base of the toilet so that he could see it and a colored mat that was bright red next to the tub. And then I had other things in there too, so that he could see the tub. Um, he wasn't at the point where he was sitting in a shower chair yet, uh, but we also, he was afraid of getting his face wet. So we had to address that by getting him a handheld shower uh, nozzle so that we could wash him. Um, now, when they get to a certain point, you don't want to hand that to them for them to clean themselves because you, the walls, the bathroom, everything else will get doused. And then you've got a bigger mess to clean up. Also, um, as I said before, modesty can be a very big issue and some people do not wish to be seen naked. Uh, using something like the D Dignity Resource Council's Dignity Wear, which is uh, it's a two-piece garment for women. It's a terry uh, cover that goes over the top and a skirt that goes over the bottom. It's uh, the skirt up for the bottom of men. Um, you can wash underneath and around it. You can uh, get teach them how to, if they're at the point where they can't really remember how to bathe, you can put a washcloth with soap in it on their wet washcloth on, with soap on it, on their skin, and then guide their hand until they take over and start bathing themselves. Anything you can do to empower them to do the work makes your load just that much lighter. So any of those things works. Uh, having scents in there, playing their favorite music, whatever they grew up with, that is going to probably their, their favorite music. Have that playing or have soothing music like you would at the spa. Uh, just something to give it a, a, a nice warm feeling. And because hypothermia happens very quickly in somebody with dementia, make sure the bathroom is warm or that you have warm towels or a warm bathrobe to wrap them in immediately so that they don't get hypothermia. Oh my goodness. So much content there. I have so many questions for you. <laughs> sure. So you mentioned about various stages of the disease. Are you able to, to articulate what they are? Okay. I'll, I'll just make it generalized. Um, mild cognitive impairment is when they can still function on their own, but they're needing lots of, of reminder notes. So you'll see notes everywhere because they need to remember to take out the trash, to brush their teeth, to call so-and-so in the morning or whatever it is they need to do. It's when you start seeing post-it notes everywhere. Um, when they get into early moderate, that's when they start having trouble with activities of daily living. So they are having, they can't necessarily pay their bills. They are having trouble remembering social events. They are withdrawing socially because it's too overwhelming. Uh, so that's that's when they start needing help. When they get into the latter part of the moderate disease, and this was the longest part of the disease, um, that's when they need more help. And that's where family members usually are, are stepping in at that point, trying to help them with their daily care, making sure that they eat, make, making sure that they don't leave the stove on. Um, these are the times when you're going to start noticing you know, other oddities happening uh, where things are in weird places that you aren't expecting. Um, you might find you know, things coming hubbied away, uh, stashed under the bed. The, the, a big one is like hiding food under the bed. If they grew up during the depression and food insecurity was a big thing for them when they were a child, you're going to find food hoarding all over the place. It could be in the bathroom. It could be in the bedroom. It could be even in places you would not expect to find food. If it's somebody that like ha wears dentures, there's going to be times when they get paranoid, they're going to lose their dentures and they're going to hide them so no one can steal them because they're becoming, it, it, their reality is shifting and they don't know the difference and they can't tell that somebody's not going to take it, but in their mind, it's a worry for them and they don't want to lose it. So it's making sure that you would, are able to address these issues. And then when they get too severe, that's when they become bedridden. That's when it's the last part of the disease. They stop talking or they might be down to like five or six words and that's all you can get out of them. They, the tunnel vision is so bad that they only look in one spot. They don't really react to a lot of things. Um, light, lighting becomes an issue where you 
they might, you know, it might bother them or it might not, but I mean, it just, it depends on the person. They, they can hear you, but they can't respond. They don't know how, I mean, in the moderate stage, they start losing their nouns, which is why they start asking these weird questions. Like uh, one of my favorites, my dad would ask me is when is the jet landing? I finally figured out that, that he wanted to know when we were done with our task and we would be driving home because he wanted to go home. Um, so, I mean, just whatever the question was, I had to figure out what he was asking me. And because the nouns were gone, it was kind of like a, a word game with us where I got to solve that problem. Um, but there's a lot of things that can happen during the, the moderate stage. That's when you're going to have the most meltdowns. That's when, now I created a thing called the behavior trigger list that's on my website. It's also mentioned in the book to help you identify the things that are tr uh, creating the weird behaviors that they're doing. Uh, one of the things that you might notice is that they'll react to sounds that you don't hear anymore because they can no longer just differentiate or filter out the sounds. So like if you're in a restaurant and there's a lot of background noise or there's a lot of glass clinkings or somebody drops a dish and it shatters, you could start noticing them getting agitated. So anything can upset them with that. Also flickering candles or flickering lights. Uh, glare is a problem, especially if you have like waxed floors. Uh, so if you have a bathroom with a shiny tile, you want to remove or, or, or cover the shine so that they don't get glare and it causes a hallucination because it can trigger them thinking there are critters on the floor, that there are people in the room with them. There's, there's a lot of different ways it can go depending on how their dementia is progressing and the characteristics of that person. What a hideous disease. And yeah. uh, the fact that you have survived caregiving four times is amazing. Were there times when you, during each of these processes, you just wanted to give up? Uh, with my dad, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I, it was so hard. If it wasn't for my husband, I would not have been able to do it. I mean, it between the two of us, we were able to manage it. And then I had family and friends that, and, and my aunt also stepped in. We had a lot of support, but I was the 24 seven person. He shadowed me everywhere. The only time I got downtime was when my husband was home or when I was going to the bathroom. So it was, uh, can be challenging. Um, I worked from home. My husband, uh, because we were having to, we were self-employed, we are self-employed. Um, we had to make sure money came in. And so if I was doing something with my dad, I couldn't be answering the phones. And so my husband was having to do double duty. So there were times we, it was so exhausting. We would just fall into bed and we would forget. We, we didn't even have time for each other for a while. And when my dad moved in with us, for the first six months, he would be outside my door uh, every 30 minutes because of something set him off and he would be calling my name and I would need to calm him down and then take him back to bed. And he would calm down, go back to sleep. I would just get to sleep and he would be back at the door again because something else set him off. And that went on for six months. Mm -hmm. After that happened, uh, my husband and I thought, oh my God, we've got to figure something out for us because that's too easy for a relationship to fall apart if living in the same house is not a relationship. You have to do something to keep the relationship alive. So what we ended up doing, and this is going to sound crazy, and I talk about this in my book, is we created a deodorant date by accident. We ran out of deodorant. And instead of, of um, writing it on the grocery list, my husband looked at each other and he goes, do you want to sneak out of the house? My dad had just gone to sleep. We knew he had a three hour window of sleeping. And we thought, oh, we can just run down the street for 30 minutes and go to the grocery store. And so we ran down to the grocery store. And then because we didn't want anyone to know we were doing anything weird, which of course, then you, everybody notices you because you're acting weird. Um, we kind of played chase around the store and then we were kind of necking behind certain aisles. <laughs> and so of course we're living in a small town. Um, there is nobody in the grocery store, but the employees at nine o'clock at night. And so we were in there doing this. And of course then it was entertaining to the, the, uh, grocery staff. So then we finally got our deodorant. We went up to the front and they're going, so what were you two doing? And then we had to admit that we were on our first deodorant date. And so anytime we went to the store without my dad, they're going, oh, is this the deodorant date? You know, it just became a running joke with everybody, but it was something fun. We looked forward to it. It was naughty. It's kind of like, you know, you get that feeling when you sneak out of the house and even though we're emancipated adults, we can, you know, we can take time and there, you are allowed to take time and just figure out when you can do it when your loved one won't be, you know, in, in danger or could hurt themselves or something. So it was when we figured that out, we started doing regular dates and we would speed date and it was a lot of fun. So th there are things you can do, but yeah, we were, we were going nuts. 
Oh my, I'm laughing back here, imagining the two of you running around in the store. I think that's fabulous. That's 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 really dear endearing. Um, I want to go back to when you were sharing about your dad and the water on his face. So do dementia patients have, in your experience, do they have a fear of water? Some do, not all do. Um, I this came to a head because my I wanted to take my dad swimming with me at the Y because I was training for a triathlon, and so I there was he would agree he agreed to go to a water class where they did adult aerobics, and um, so I could swim laps and then they had the adult aerobics in the the next pool over. So it was really really nice community center, and so, um, but he didn't want to get water on his face. Fortunately, because it was stand up aerobics and because my dad was very personable, all the women in the pool adopted him and he suddenly <laughs> became their buddy. And so he was like, Oh, I can do this. And so we were able to do it. And then we would, uh, we, okay. I discovered the hard way the very first time that we had to use the family dressing rooms. We could not go separately. Um, the first time we went separately, he lost his clothes. It became an epic epic incident um, because he he was naked he didn't have anything but his wet swimsuit and a towel fortunately because again we live in a small town everybody rallied together one man gave him his, a set of shoes out of his gym bag another guy gave him sweats they gave and it was just in the middle of winter so we got him all dressed up and then i was talking to the staff saying you know i i know it's in the men's locker room someplace they found it they called me two hours later we were able to go back down and get it but oh my gosh his mood tanked he was so angry with himself that he could not find his own clothing mm -hmm. so that's when i knew we had to do the family dressing room and then we would just you know we would just shower and go and do our thing and and it was just we just had to get over it and, and yeah it was it was um a big learning experience but when he and i were talking about not getting water on his face he was like going i don't want to drown but it was mm -hmm. only when water was coming down from the shower and that's when we adjusted our shower so we'd have a handheld shower so that he could you know bathe differently and we had a, we also had an adjustable head so he could move it to one level so that he wasn't getting water in the face and and then he would just use a washcloth and just pat his face but you know it's amazing what you're sharing not only are you a, a loving daughter and a phenomenal caregiver but it sounds like you're also a private detective like you have to do a lot of <laughs> investigative work to figure out what's going on to get to the bottom of how he's behaving or how they were behaving well, I, I'm going to confess, I had 75% failure rate. It's the 25% success rate you're hearing about right now. It, I had to fail and fail forward and fail forward. And I was reading book after book after book. I was talking to everybody I knew that was doing dementia care until I found something that worked. And then finally, you know, I was just like, okay, this is what works. And then I shared it with anybody that was going to help us to make sure. And that's the other thing. Um, you can give people instructions. You can talk to them about the instructions about what you can and can't do when you take somebody out. But if they're not used to dealing with someone with dementia, um, they're going to fall back into their old routine of whatever their comfort level is and then have a catastrophic meltdown. Uh, and then they may not want to help you anymore. I had that kind of with my family where I was coaching them because we had a lifetime of routine that we did. And my husband and I figured out right away that that really was not going to work. Uh, but because the rest of the family wasn't in on it day in and day out, it was a learning experience. My poor sister uh, didn't understand to ask my father if she could help him zip up his coat when he was having trouble zipping up his coat one time. And so she just grabbed it out of his hand and started zipping it up and he clocked her in the eye and gave her a shiner. I mean, so it's, you've, you've, you know, got to take the good with the bad, understand that these things could happen and that, 90% of the time it was us causing him to melt down and the other 10% was the disease. So um, once we learned that and that we found out that we could get him in an elevated moods, oh, it was so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you just mentioned about training for a, a triathlon. I feel like you've run like a th hundred thousand miles from everything that you, you've done. It just sounds exhausting. So Tracy, what I want to ask you is some people out there who maybe are not in this situation, or maybe they are as a caregiver might be thinking, well, why don't I put my loved one into a facility instead of taking care of them? What are the pros and cons to that? 
Well, for some people, that's the right choice. Not everyone is a caregiver, and that's okay. If that's not your skill set, do not force yourself on that family member because more than likely, uh, one or both of you is going to have an event that you're going to regret for the rest of your life, or it could lead to elder abuse. So it's if you are not the person to take care of them, if that is not your skill set and that's not your wheelhouse, um, find a good facility that can help with that. However, with the pandemic that we're coming out of and with the way people are turning over staff right now, it's going to require a lot of family input coming, you know, whether it's daily, weekly, whatever it is to make sure that the staff knows you because the more the staff knows you and respects you, the more, the better the care your family member is going to get. So you, if you are in a facility with a family member, because I, my last, uh, my, my aunt, before she died, um, we had her in a memory care unit. Um, I was there almost every single day. And I did that because I, she was my favorite person on the planet. I wanted to make sure that she was uh, well taken care of because she was, in my mind, the jewel of the family. She'd been for every single one of us. Um, the staffing was turning over uh, weekly. And so it was really hard for us to, and she was also had additional health issues besides the dementia. She had cancer. She was on oxygen. She uh, had diabetes. I mean, and she was having multiple uh, heart events. So uh, it, it really required us to be there. Now there's other issues where like you are a long distance away and then finding, trying to find some way to care for them because it's not possible to move them to where you are. That also happens. And that's a place where you're going to feel very, very guilty. And then having some way of keeping an eye on them, but making sure that you've got a, a good place for them to stay. Um, when you are looking at places, if, if you choose to someplace that's outside of your home, uh, you want to check with your, whatever your local ombudsman is and see what the reports are for that state, for that facility to find out if they've been written up and how they've corrected any of the items that they have. Find out what they are rated online. Talk to people in the area and find out, is it a good facility? Um, sometimes they are so overstaffed that you're going to find your family member declines really quickly because all they're going to do is uh, lock them in a chair or strap them someplace and, and they're just going to sit there all day and they're just going to deteriorate. So it just depends on what the facility is and how they are rated. But yeah, definitely ask around, talk to people. Um, because you also want to know how does the facility smell? Does it smell like urine? Are they do they have enough staff to keep it clean? Do the do they have activities? Because that's another big thing. You want to have a facility that has activities. And I shouldn't say facility, I should call it a community. You want someplace that's a community, not a facility. You want someplace where it is engaging, where they might have story time, where they might do arts and crafts, something that they can keep their brain health uh, up. And, you know, and just let them age naturally as opposed to just withering away. So does that answer your question? Yes, yes, that definitely does answer my question. Now, you also mentioned about the various phases. At some point, the loved one, the patient is still in there. It, they're still in there and they still have the ability to say, yes, I will, or no, I won't. So in your experience, when does that actually convert where they no longer have the right to make their own decisions? You might have a power of attorney, but yet they're still in there saying, no, I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to do that. And you can't force them because they're not, they're not independent, but yet they're not totally dependent on you. So I guess the question here is, why are they saying no? What is the fear that needs to be addressed? Because there is some fear that needs to be addressed. Uh, and also, uh, I mean, maybe it's the fear of giving up their independence. They don't want to give their independence up. Um, if you can do something like bring in a, a a, a, somebody that can assist them in their home or you are able to assist them in your home. Now for the last year I was helping my aunt in her home before we moved her into the care facility. Um, it, it's very, very exhausting trying to work full time and do this and commute to do care. So uh, you, it's, you have to have some sort of black backup plan or you're going to burn out very quickly. So um, 
I guess it depends on the circumstance of the person. If it is someplace where they're saying yes or no, um, we ended up having a, hitting the 911 cap, which forced our hand because the, the that's and every every place has a 911 cap. It's a financial cap, not and when the calls come too close together uh, to get help at your home or wherever you're living, um, then your county can come in and say, uh, you have to move. You are no longer safe to live at home. So that can be a forced hand, which happened to us with my aunt. Um, that does not happen to everybody. But towards end of life, that can happen where somebody's having multiple health events and then they are forced, they are mandated basically by your state saying this person cannot live on their own. That forces it. Um, as far as trying to convince them, it is getting into their story, finding out what it is that they need and they're looking for, and then being able to cater to that. And sometimes it's just, uh, just taking them to go visit it a few times, get used to the idea, maybe have lunch or dinner or a meal with the people in that facility. So they start getting to know people. Uh, anything you can do to empower them will have a, a better or more positive result. Um, it's really hard when you have to apologize to the person because you had the state come in and say, you can't live by yourself anymore. You're being put here. Uh, at least we were given the opportunity to find some place before. Uh, we, we had two weeks, to, well, actually only a week, to find a place to get my aunt before our hands were tied. So uh, we, we did it. But that not everyone can do that. And so there's gonna there's some really awful horror stories about the things that people weren't able to do and what happened to their family members and trying to advocate for them. So you, you want to try and plan ahead for that because you know it's going to be coming. Um, find out what their fear is and start addressing that first and have them play a part in choosing it if you can. Um, that may or may not work. You are an encyclopedia of phenomenal information. And we're, <laughs> we're going to get to your book in just a moment. I, I want to talk about the fact that we, we discussed this backstage. You're very festive, have on that beautiful holiday sweater. And holidays are difficult for people as it is. So yeah. people are used to having certain traditions. And now all of a sudden there's a loved one who is not able to share in things as they used to be and things change. I know you've written an article on this and mm -hmm. you have a lot of experience. Can you tell us how can people actually create new traditions or find new ways of doing things during the holiday instead of, oh, we can't do this anymore. Oh, because of her, we can't go here. Some of the things that people might be thinking. You have to reinvent your holidays and be willing to let some things go and create new traditions, um, which it's not a bad thing. Sometimes it's fun. Sometimes you discover things that you didn't think of before. Uh, one of the things that I highly recommend is spreading the holidays out. Uh, if you exhaust someone with dementia, you're going to get a catastrophic meltdown, and they they and you won't see it coming. It'll just they'll just be sitting there, and all of a sudden they start screaming, yelling, crying, throwing things, whatever it is, because you don't understand that they are exhausted, they're overwhelmed. So if you can change your tradition to invite just a few people over at a time, have them under and this is again later in the dementia when they're earlier in their dementia it's not that not that imperative but if you can have a few people over at a time you know maybe two maybe three um you, and then you have an activity that is suited to their skill level. So uh, I really like memory books where you create the person's story. You uh, put it in from the age, current age they are now all the way back to when they were five. It tells their story and their timeline. It can be a way to start communication and have them tell you stories that you uh, maybe you hadn't heard before. Or it could be an epic work of fiction. And then you have a great story to tell after they're gone about how this story about how Uncle Sam was changing his time over here turns into this wild road trip that was with Thelma and Louise. I mean, you just don't know what you're going to get. So you have to kind of be open to it. Realize that they aren't going to be able to do as many activities, but you can also spread it out. Christmas doesn't have to be a day. You can, or whatever holiday it is, it can be spread out over a timeline and then everybody gets socialized. Uh, your family member gets social time and everybody gets to spend time with them individually. It doesn't have to be for long periods of time. You can make it for 30 minutes or half an hour or an hour and a half. It could be that you all watch a movie together that somebody likes. It could be a holiday movie. It could be something else. I, or you have activities where maybe you do finger painting or you make cookies or whatever it is that is at their skill level that everybody can participate in and enjoy. Um, it also helps your family members understand that they need to focus on your loved one 
and they need to focus on you because you are not going to be able to rise to their occasion. They're going to have to adapt to what you can do because it's, you are there trying to keep your loved one safe, healthy, happy, and going. And they're coming in. Some people like to come in and just give you all their opinions about what you're doing wrong. Not going to fly. You need to actually be supportive. And then you can create your own good memories because nobody wants to be at what, at the time that your loved one passes grieving over what they od- should have done. But create the memories now. You're going to look back on those. They're going to have a lot of power. They're, they're going to stick with you for the rest of your life. So Anything you can do to give yourself a moment of joy, anything you can do to share with that family member so that you aren't grieving as much, you're going to grieve, but not as much, and that you don't have grief attacks afterwards because of all these things you didn't do, and it just hits you like being walled by a a snowball. So reinvent your holidays. Thank you. And I just want to dig in a little bit of what you're saying that uh, sometimes the patient can feel overwhelmed. So you should try to spread things out. Should you engage the patient and ask them what they'd like or ask them for their input or just create these traditions for oh, them? Definitely ask them. Do you want them to participate? Because the, the more they participate, the more they're going to look forward to it. You get better behavior days because now they're anticipating something. If you also have it marked in a place where they can see that it's coming up um, and then keep pointing to that and reminding them that, that it's coming up. Again, anything you can do to get good behavior days where you're, it's going to make your life easier and they have something to look forward to. Because most of the times the things that we look forward to, it's the anticipation building up to it and not necessarily the event. And then it takes two or three weeks and then we look back at the event going, oh yeah, that was fun or this or that happened. And you, but maybe at the time you're experiencing it, it might not have been as fun as you're now embellishing it. So it's just, it's one of those things where you have to just kind of cater it to them. The rest of the family can adjust that we're, we're all adults. We can, we can make up our own mind and adjust to this and participate or not. I mean, it's, it's whatever the person you, you as the family member feels like you can do. Um, Also, let them see when your family member melts down, that if they don't ever see them melting down, they're not going to believe you. If they're sitting there when somebody suddenly goes catastrophic on them and starts screaming or yelling or throwing things or, you know, just, you know, telling them that they're a horrible person, accusing them of every crime in the planet, uh, they don't know. And they will also, they've probably never experienced how to walk somebody down from that. So if you don't have distraction techniques in place, if they don't know, I mean, there's, there's got to be some way where you can move them to a quiet spot afterwards, the, uh, the person that melted down so that they can have a chance to regain calm. So it's important when you're doing your holiday strategies to have a quiet place. If you can take them back to their room, play soft music or put on their favorite television show or movie or whatever it is, um, and then wrap them in a warm blanket, get them something warm to drink uh, so that they feel safe and secure. Uh, otherwise, you know, you're going to be having all sorts of problems. Um, They could wet themselves. I mean, there's all sorts of things that can happen that you don't expect. And some people, um, when they get upset, they vomit and you don't want to deal with that either. No, (laughs) you really don't. I mean, so yeah, Uh, not speaking from experience. (laughs) Well, your book is truly a Bible for dementia home care. And I would love for you to, we see the book behind you, but hold it up and then actually read from it if you would. And tell us about the article, the holiday article as well. We have that uh, put into the comments. So the, I wrote the holiday article because uh, so many people have catastrophic meltdowns at, at during the holidays because they don't know that they're, family member has changed. So I put in there a a description on how to take your family and reinvent the holidays, how to show your family that's not nearby, send them pictures regularly so that they can see especially if your family's had a health change as they're declining, especially with Alzheimer's disease or with, you know, FTD or Parkinson's, the person's going to decline. You don't want to shock them when they get there. You want to let them know ahead of time to by seeing that photo so that they understand that there really are changes going on. Um, It gives you strategies on how to uh, reinvent your holiday and create great memories to take pictures of it. And also exit strategies. If you're, let's say that you go to a, a, a choir to hear, you know, the, your grandson sing in a choir. 
um, and you're in a crowded high school auditorium where you need to know where you can get them to a quiet place or how you're going to get out of there quickly if they start getting overwhelmed by the noise. So uh, it's it's that sort of thing. Also explaining to the families how they can participate to bring photos of their family, family members of them together and to sit down and talk about it and share memories of it. So anything you can do that will create that family moment is discussed in that article. Now in the book, I am going to read you the introduction, if you don't mind. Is that all right? Absolutely, please. Okay. So it says, we all look for quick answers and shortcuts, especially when we're under great stress. This book is for anyone who is struggling to care for someone with dementia. It contains what can I try in this moment tips you can use whether you are caring for your family member or friend. Each person's journey is different. The road of dementia care will change every aspect of your loved one's life and theirs, of your life and theirs, excuse me. Dementia is like playing hide and seek. Ready or not, here I come. None of us saw dementia barreling down the hill at us like a Mack truck with no brakes because it arrives slowly with plausible explanations for everything. Only when we look back do we see the mounting evidence. No two people experience dementia the same way. No two family members will care for a loved one with dementia the same way. Caring for someone with dementia is the most stressful burdens a person can ever accept. We have more training to drive a car, operate a smartphone, or boil water than we do to take care of someone who is saying the long goodbye. Unlike a day job, with dementia care, there are no vacations, no pay raises, no glowing performance reviews. Unlike raising a child, there's no first day of kindergarten, no graduations, and no weddings to look forward to. My journey started when my younger sister called to tell me our father reached his tipping point with our mother and didn't have the health to continue caring for her. Our mother had cancer and the treatment caused her dementia. My husband and I decided I would quit my job and take over my mother's care. What I didn't know then was that my father already traveled down the road of Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is a great mimic, disguising itself as anything else, even from the person who has the disease. I didn't discover he had it for several more years. I wasn't a caregiver. I didn't know the first thing about caregiving. I didn't have any medical training. I did know I needed help and a lot of it. The caregiver, that's you and me. You may think you are a care you are, you may think a caregiver is a person working at a skilled nursing facility who is trained and gets paid. Nope. We fall into the category we tend to think of ourselves as wives, husbands, life partners, daughters, sons, friends, or extended family. You are a caregiver. Even if you are 3,000 miles away and managing as much as humanly possible over the phone, you are still a caregiver. We are America's largest healthcare provider, the unpaid family caregiver. Ooh, that's, uh, that's amazing the way you just qualify that. And also the fact that you don't have to be there day to day. And many times people can't be there. And that doesn't mean that they're not impacted mm -hmm. or they're not emotional about it or they're not in need of self-care as well. Precisely. Yeah. One of the things I love about your book is the way that it's organized and the, that box that you have. Tell us about that and show us if you would. Okay. So um, I wrote this book uh, because I didn't have a book to help me. And I wanted certain things where I could either page fan or find what I was looking for. And so let's make sure you can see this. At the beginning of each chapter, and let me turn this so I can go to the camera. Okay. At the beginning of each chapter, I list out what is in that chapter. So you know you've gotten to the right place. Um, I have an enormous eight-page table of contents. Um, this is literally a dementia map. It is in the order that you will approximately go through the disease. Literally, you can run your fingers down the table of contents till you find the thing that matches what you're dealing with. And you can literally turn to that page and then have the help you need right when you need it. I did not have that. I can remember searching for things that I had read like two weeks earlier, and I would be going through every single book I had. I couldn't find it. I didn't 
no, I wasn't smart enough at the time to mark the spot. And so I would find it another month later or two weeks later when I was looking for something else. And so it was really frustrating me. So I wanted to make sure that this was a toolbox that you can use the tools when you need them. Now, another thing that I have come up against recently is I have a lot of ladies telling me that their husbands don't want to see a dementia care book in their house. So one of the really interesting things we came up with is if you were in high school and you used to cover your book in brown paper bags, you can make a cover for this with a brown paper bag, write home economics on it, mark chapter 13 because chapter 13 is what's for dinner. And then if your husband comes up behind you and asks you what you're reading, you can quickly, if you hear him flip to that page, have him pick out what he wants for dinner. So, you know, there's more than one way to use a dementia book. <laughs> What would you like people to take away from reading the book? There is hope. There are other people that are going through this with you. You are not alone. There are resources available to help you. And that on those days when you are feeling helpless, there is something that can help you through it. So well said. Thank you. Thank you so much. And for anyone who is out there and they're feeling alone, they're feeling isolated, maybe they're frustrated, maybe they want to scream, what advice do you have for them on that? <laughs> Go someplace quiet, scream into your pillow. <laughs> Go take a fast walk. You you really do need to have downtime. You need to be able to vent. Uh, call a friend. Have some sort of safety net there that you can call somebody, talk to them. Uh, give yourself, you know, uh, take a quick, fast-paced walk. Anything you can do to uh, burn off that angst. Um, realize that and give yourself permission to be human. We are all human. We forget that about ourselves. Sometimes we think we have to be superhuman, that we have to do more than we are physically capable of. And no, you don't. You just need to give yourself the downtime, recognize that you are human, that you have failings, and that you are doing the best that you can. And that's what we ask of you. There you go. Tracy, you are an incredible person. I am so happy and grateful to know you, to have met you, to have you on our team. You're one of our elevated listeners. You jumped right in and said, let me take that course and learn about listening. Listening skills are so important, even as a caregiver, when someone's not speaking, watching their body language, and then being a good listener and observer for, uh, for them as well. So thank you for jumping in and thank you so much for being here again. This is a message that needs to be repeated over and over again because there is no, there's no one size fits all. And, and to your point, when someone has dementia, it can go on for a very long time. And if you are in that caregiver situation, you might have what, 10 years or more to or put more. in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't remember, I think it was Lori LeBay took care of her mom for 30 years. Mm. So um, yeah, there's, and, oh, and, and just a shout out to Lori LeBay. Um, she created a, a website called dementiamap.com. It is a global resource if you cannot get out of your house because you are in an area that's say that you're in the a, a very, you know, uh, I'm going blank on the term. Uh, you're out, not in an urban area, whatever, outside the city. Anyway, someplace where you can't get help. There are resources, there's education, there's support groups, there's everything that you can imagine on this and it's still growing. It's been a brainchild of hers that she and Dave Wheeler put together. It's got fantastic resources. Uh, again, it's one of those things where it's uh, it takes a, a, a village to raise a child. Well, this is going to be, it takes a village to help you get through dementia. And she has created just that. Wonderful. Well, I'm just so appreciative, as I mentioned, and especially being here during the holidays, taking that time out and giving some direction and encouragement for people who are going through this during the holidays. So please do come back and see us again. And also, thank you for being such a, a loyalty member and liking our programming. I notice it. I appreciate it. And I really do appreciate you. Oh, thank you very much. I really enjoy you and I enjoy what the programming that you're putting out. And I just wanted to say thank you. Oh, thank you. And for people who are not able to read the banner or they can't um, understand where to find the book, you can go to Tracy's website. It's her name, Tracy, T-R-A-C-Y, Cram, C-R-A-M, Perkins, P-E-R-K-I-N-S dot com. You can almost also email her. Can people contact you if they're going through something and they really need to talk? Absolutely. Absolutely. Feel free. 
Okay, fantastic. And her email address is her name, Tracy, T-R-A-C-Y at TracyCranPerkins.com. And she's on social media. So go find her and connect. I say this to people from the heart. People like Tracy are here to help you. If you don't reach out, you never know what could happen if you do reach out. And so Tracy didn't know she'd be writing this book based on her experience and helping so many people. I didn't know I would be creating this platform and having people come on and share their stories. What are you doing out there in TV and radio land that you can be helping other people by sharing your story? So we welcome you here to book your interview, usaglobaltv.com. We invite you to purchase Tracy's book to get her is it a newsletter or it's an article uh, oh the article is on my website it's uh on actually it's on the media page under articles and interviews so if you click down there you'll be able to find that and Fantastic. then uh yeah definitely you can reach me through social all right i'm going to be taking a look at this article so thank you and tracy i wish you very happy holidays and happy new year and please do come back and see us very soon I am looking forward to it. And thank you. Have a happy holiday to you too. Thanks. Take care. Bye for now. <laughs> Bye. Oh my goodness. It just warms my heart to have Tracy here providing such amazing information that you could do a lot of research on your own, which is phenomenal, but you're actually hearing from someone who's experienced surviving caregiving of dementia patients, family members. You know, it's different if you don't know the person, but when you know them and you love them, that's a whole other story. And she just shared everything that she's, I'm sure there's more of what she's learned and put it into her book. So I highly recommend that you purchase her book. If you don't know where the website is, go to Amazon, put in her name, just reach out and do something. And again, if you're struggling, you're not alone. Come share your story, contact Tracy, contact me. All of our information is out there. Thank you so much. We do not have any more shows today because our team members are all on holiday which is fabulous. We'll be coming back tomorrow with more shows. And we invite you to go to our YouTube channel, which is USA Global TV and radio. And also, if you are following me on social media, I will be putting a lot of awards out there for our guests and our team members, people who have really contributed this year. And uh, please do help me celebrate their accomplishments. You can find me on Facebook, Jacqueline Kerbeck, USA Global TV, Dr. Jacqueline, Dr. Jacqueline's Health and Wellness. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Instagram, Dr. Jacqueline. LinkedIn is my name, Jacqueline Kerbeck. So help me celebrate people who are coming forward and sharing and giving with their heart. Thanks again to all of you for watching and for listening. Happy holidays. We'll see you again tomorrow. Bye.